Good evening, everyone, and welcome once again to the Nuclear Physics Masterclass webinar series, back for week two. Uh, my name is Chris Stewart. I am a local York-based freelance science communicator. I once was a physicist, no more. Now I much prefer doing stuff like this, learning about really exciting physics with our partners at the University of York and all the other universities involved in these webinars. Listen, this webinar series, series of four, we started last week with a look at the building blocks of the universe. What are the things that, that everything around us is made up of and where did they come from? All these different elements and atoms and isotopes, what are they and where did they come from? Next week, we're gonna be looking at medical physics and applications of nuclear physics to, to the medical professions. The week after that, we're zooming right down into the nucleus to figure out what's going on inside there. What are all these particles and what are they made of? But tonight, tonight we're going to be looking at nuclear fusion. Last week, we had a bit of a look at nuclear fission, which is where big nuclei split apart. This week, we're looking at nuclear, nuclear fusion, where small nuclei squeeze together to create new kinds of atoms. So we've got two speakers who are going to talk to us about that very exciting topic tonight. We'll get to that in a moment. However, there's a couple of things that I need to, to get through first. Um, tonight's uh, webinar is going to take the form, as it did last week and as it will for the rest of the series, of two short 15-minute presentations. Um, and uh, around those presentations, you'll have the opportunity to ask some questions. Now, the way you do that is by using the Q and A button down the bottom of the Zoom screen. Someone's already discovered that one, asking, will the recording be shared? Yes, we are recording these, and those, um, I believe, are going to be put up onto the uh, Masterclass website and the, uh, the Masterclass YouTube channel at a later stage. Um, so yes, if you want to ask some questions as we go along, throw those into the Q&A chat, and I will gather those together at the end of each of the talks and ask them on your behalf, paraphrase them, merge some of them together, fuse some of them together, and we'll get through as many as we possibly can. If we don't happen to get to your question, those of you who are participating in the Nuclear Physics Masterclass, of course, you've always got the opportunity to go onto the Masterclass website where you can find the question forum and you can throw your questions on there. So if we don't manage to get to them tonight, then that's always a possibility. And our nuclear physics experts will very quickly answer your question on the, on the forum. So you've always got that one up your sleeve. Another thing to keep in mind is that if you want to, you can turn on the closed captions, the, um, the automated captioning service, which is always entertaining. Um, there's another button down the bottom of the Zoom screen there. So you can, uh, you can turn that one on and read along as we go. Um, so those subtitles are available. And of course, if you have any technical problems and you get bumped off the Zoom for any reason, then you can always just rejoin using the link that you used to get here in the first place. So with any luck, we won't have any technical issues and this will all go perfectly smoothly here tonight. But as I said, we're here tonight to talk about nuclear fusion. This is the process that is going on deep in the core of all of the stars in the universe, including our own sun. Um, and the tantalizing possibility, not just of understanding that process, but of actually using it down here on Earth. And if that sounds like a particularly difficult challenge, you're right, it is. It's one of the biggest challenges that we've got in modern physics is capturing and using the processes of nuclear fusion to produce energy here on Earth. So we have a couple of speakers that are gonna to talk to us about that tonight. And it is my pleasure to introduce the first of those I would like you to meet, Dr. Kate Lancaster. She's an experimental plasma physicist at the University of York. And she has been doing research for a long time on how on earth can we manage to get these fusion processes and bottle them somehow here on Earth. So please make a very, very welcome. Kate, over to you. Tell us about fusion. Thank you so much. Right, I'll just uh, share my screen. Okay, everyone can see? Lovely. Okay, so uh, yeah, I, as Chris says, I'm Dr. Kate Lancaster. I'm based at the University of York uh, and I play around with fusion for a living. Um, I'm gonna be asking the question, is it possible to build a star on earth? Because as Chris said, um, this is indeed the very stuff of stars. 
Uh, that might sound like I'm just playing around wasting taxpayers' money, and, and indeed that might still be true, but yeah, really what we're trying to do is kind of um, capture the processes that power the stars and, and bring them to Earth. And so hopefully after this talk, this short talk in, on the topic of fusion, you'll be able to see at least some of, of what we're trying to do. So my, this picture here, I took out of a very tall tower. I think it was called the Century Tower in uh, Yokohama uh, when I was in a conference. And I think it really summarizes uh, the issues that we face as, as humanity on earth in that we're energy addicts. You can see here, this is the Yokohama is right next to Tokyo. So you can see looking out, over the sort of diaspora of, of, uh, of both Yokohama and then wider Tokyo, it's just lights, a sea of lights and energy being used. And as our population is increasing, you know, it's gonna stabilize at around 10 billion people. That's a lot of people. That means we're gonna need a lot, of, a lot more energy than we currently have. And especially as people's lives get better and um, uh, the standard of living goes up, the more energy you're going to be consuming. Uh, and as it stands, the energy that we have from, from conventional means like fossil fuels, for example, will not sustain us into the future. So unless we do something else, we're going to have a, an energy gap uh, where we have, we, we're using more energy than we have to supply, unfortunately. Uh, now, that sounds like a, a bit of bad news for a Wednesday evening, but uh, hopefully you'll see that uh, scientists like myself and Ed uh, are really trying very hard to kind of give ourselves a, a, a future energy source that's going to sustain us in the future so that we're not going to end up like this scared cat here uh, and uh, for the rest of our lives, okay? So if we look out into our dear universe, you can just see seas of stars and galaxies. And if we zoom into the center of stars, you see there are atoms, particularly hydrogen, coming together to fuse into helium and then heavier elements. Um, and this process releases energy, and that is the energy that powers the stars. I'm going to tell you about how that works in, in a little while. Um, so it's responsible for making elements heavier than hydrogen in the universe up till iron, okay? And then if you go beyond that, you'll need things like supernovae because iron is very, very stable. So you need to, to do something extra in order to get heavier elements. But the point of fact is that were it not for nuclear fusion in stars, we simply wouldn't exist at all because we're all made of bits of star that have been spat out into the universe and then formed planets and plants and animals and people and record players and all sorts of stuff. And it's only because of nuclear fusion that we're, we're allowed to be here at all. And also, you know, we, we, we're powered by nuclear fusion as it stands. The sun is a nuclear fusion reactor. It sits in the sky. It gives us light and heat and sustains life on Earth. So nuclear fusion is honestly fundamental to life as we know it. So it'd be pretty awesome if we could uh, capture the sun's energy. Well, so we do, we can do that through solar cells and so forth, but what would happen if we could make a miniature star instead that we had exquisite control over, that we could do our, our bidding with, switch it on and off whenever we wanted, rather than having to wait for it to shine. And that's, and that's the story of what we're talking about is making a star in a jar uh, for of our very own. So where does the energy come from? Well, this is a world's most uh, famous equation, e equals mc squared, and it completely underpins uh, the physics of what's going on. So we're gonna try and do something similar to what's inside the sun, um, bringing two types of hydrogen together. So we're, particularly the sun, um, brings two protons together ostensibly. What we're doing is bringing um, deuterium and tritium, um, which are heavy hydrogens. Um, deuterium is present in seawater in very large amounts. For, for every about 6,000 hydrogens, there's a deuterium. So yeah, vast quantities in the sea. Uh, and then we have tritium, uh, where for every 10 to the 17 hydrogens, there's only one tritium. So it's not naturally occurring. So you might think, well, Kate, you fusion physicists are a bunch of idiots for um, trying to build an energy source, something that's not naturally occurring. Well, 
it, that might still be true, but um, we can actually make tritium. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about that in a minute. So we take our deuterium tritium, we give them lots of energy. Um, we have to overcome something called the Coulomb barrier, they're charged particles, so they really don't want to be brought together. So we need to force them together. So we need to heat it to very high temperatures. Uh, and then once they fuse together, then they produce uh, reactant um, particles, which is some helium and a neutron. So where's the energy coming from? So we can see this uh, equation E equals mc squared is probably the most fa famous equation on the planet. So this means energy equals mass times the speed of light squared. Now, Einstein said that the speed of light is, is constant in all reference frames. All right, so what, why do we care about that? Well, it's a constant, right? So, um, and C, C is a big number, so C squared is a really massive number. So you can see that energy and mass have a very intimate relationship with each other. So if we take the masses of deuterium and tritium, and add them together, do the reaction, and then add the masses of the helium and the neutron together, you'll find there's a mass difference, a mass loss between the first and the second situation. And so if you take that tiny little bit of mass and you times it by C squared, as the equation tells us we can, you get a massive amount of energy. So it's an incredibly efficient way of, of getting energy out, right? You don't need much fuel for it to, to happen. So let's get back to this problem of tritium then. Well, the neutron here is, is our guy, right? So it's carrying most of the kinetic, most of the moving energy away from this uh, interaction. And so if we surround the reactor with lithium, which is very abundant in the Earth's crust and in brines on the planet, uh, then the neutron in can interact with that lithium and produce tritium. So hopefully, if we can cover enough surface area of the reactor, then we can uh, make enough tritium to uh, fuel our energy needs. So hopefully it'll work like that. We don't know, that, well, we know nuclear physics works, but it's about quantities and about being able to produce enough tritium for this to work. So in terms of it being incredibly efficient, the energy released from burning about 40 tons of coal is the same amount of energy that you would get from the deuterium in half a bar full of seawater and the lithium in a laptop battery, right? So, uh, and I say lithium because obviously we use lithium to get tritium. So that's an incredibly small amount of fuel in comparison to 40 tons of coal. So it's a very efficient way of getting energy out. Also, this half a bar full of seawater and the lithium in a laptop battery is profound in the sense that that's basically one of your lifetime's energy needs solved. That's all the fuel that you would need to power your life for the rest of your life. So it's it's kind of a no brainer. This is it's uh, it's something we really are working towards and we've been working towards for quite a long time, but it turns out it's pretty hard. <laughs> so that's why we haven't done it yet. Right. There are other advantages as well. So, um, so I'm, I'm just going to put my cards on the table here. Fission, which is the kind of nuclear power that we have now, I'm absolutely pro that. It's something we absolutely need because it doesn't produce carbon. Okay, yes, it produces radioactive waste. It's, it's pretty efficient though. Um, but the problem is it does produce long-lived radioactive waste. So if you think about fission power stations for taking big atoms and splitting them into smaller atoms, we have to keep those... Um, uh, atoms around uh, and they decay into these long-lived radioactive isotopes. Um, so that's unfortunate. Happily, fusion does not do that. Now, I'm not going to say it produces no waste. That's not true. You've got neutrons going into the surrounding reactor um, and it can activate the material, so make radioactive, um, but it's much more short-lived than the kind of radioactive waste that you get from fission power stations. So it's really important that, that that's that's the sort of direction we're moving in. Also, um, fission, as it is, splitting a big atom into little ones or littler ones, um, requires careful monitoring. If we take our eye off the ball, bad things happen. Uh, you can see the picture here on the right is Chernobyl. Um, it's probably the worst nuclear accident on the planet that's ever existed. And that was human error, right? That wasn't actually fundamentally that fission isn't safe, that it was just human error that really um, meant that 
meltdown can happen because basically you have to keep the fuel present at all time and carefully moderate the reactions and if you don't do that then you get bad things happening fusion however is inherently safe um there's only a small amount of fuel given present at any time uh you can turn the reactor off uh, it turns out uh, it's really easy to make fusion not work because we've been doing that for the last, you know, <laughs> five decades. So, um, you know, it, it really is a case of you can switch it off, it stops, right? So so it's kind of inherently safe. Um, so that's a really big advantage in that case as well in terms of public acceptability, having reactors up the street from you, for example. Um, last but not least, it doesn't produce carbon, and that's fundamentally where we want to be. Fusion, because it's not here yet, is not going to serve, solve the near-term problem of, of carbon in the atmosphere. We need other sources of energy for that that are carbon-free, but it will ensure when it arrives a carbon-free future. And so, of course, that's why we are working on it now to, to try and figure out how to do it. So let's get to the crux of it. How does one do it? Uh, essentially, we have to... Um, heat matter to something like 10 times hotter than the sun right so the sun is 15 million degrees inside in the middle so we have to heat it to 150 million degrees kelvin to get enough reactions to happen on earth and we have to do that without touching it right we need all of those atoms to be together but obviously if you, you don't want to touch something like that because it's kind of game over a hey, game over for your hands if you touch it with your hands but whatever the vessel is whatever so you have to confine fuel at 150 million degrees Kelvin, such that all the atoms will fuse together to make fusion happen without touching it. <laughs> that seems really difficult, right? That is the crux of fusion really, is to try and keep this stuff together at really high temperatures without, without touching it so that fusion can occur. So the sun is brilliant, the stars are brilliant at doing this, they're massive, they can use their own gravitational field. However, we don't have a lab the size of a star on Earth, unfortunately. So we, we're gonna to have to be clever. We're gonna to have to do something else. And it turns out when you heat matter to these kind of high temperatures, something really interesting happens. So you're aware we have solids, liquids, and gases. If you add more energy to those atoms in the material, the atoms can like somehow fall apart. So you're left with like the nucleus, which is the middle bit, and the electrons all rising around, they part company. So you've got ions, which is the nucleus without the, the electrons on, whizzing around with the electrons. And so you've got a soup of charged particles. And that soup of charged particles is called plasma. And actually, plasma makes up about 99.9999% of the visible universe, of course, which is a very small part of the entire universe. Um, and that's why I'm a plasma physicist, because we have to understand plasma in order to get fusion to work, basically. Um, and it's a bit annoying because Plasmas are <laughs> what I would call a kind of stroppy teenager of the states of matter world. They kind of want to do the exact opposite of what you want them to do, unfortunately. Um, so, yeah, we, we've got some challenges. So. Getting fusion to work, then, what are the what are the knobs that we have to twiddle? So we've got three ostensibly the temperature. Uh, that's kind of a given, right, because, um, you know, it has to be hot and end of right so um we don't really have a lot of play with the temperature so the two other knobs that we can twiddle that we have a bit of control over are the density of particles in our system that we want to fuse together and then the time that we can confine them for where they're producing net energy uh, so it's otherwise known as the energy confinement time so there's sort of two main approaches, given that the temperature is kind of non-negotiable, ostensibly. You can either keep a sort of moderate density of particles together for a very long time, or you can keep a very high density of particles together for a short time, but then do it over and again. So it's kind of a reparated kind of affair. And that kind of directly maps onto the kind of two main ways in which we do fusion on Earth, right? So. I've written how will the box work here. We've got to put the star in a box somehow. So what do we do, right? And there's two different approaches, really. I mean, there's lots of different flavors of these approaches, by the way. Uh, this isn't an exhaustible list, um, but just this is kind of the two main ways, the kind of two mainstream ways of approaching it. So, um, so the way on the right-hand side here, which kind of looks like a big 
metal donut is <laughs> essentially uh, what we call a tokamak. Um, and what that is, is a, a device, a sort of donut shaped device where you have the, the hot plasma in the middle, which is made of charged particles. And you can ostensibly levitate that with uh, specially shaped, basically magnetic fields, because the particles in the plasma, these charged particles want to follow magnetic field lines. So if we can shape the magnetic field such that they're concentrated in the middle of the vessel and not touching the walls, then you can, in theory, keep uh, your, your plasma together for, for a long time. So that's magnetic confinement fusion. And then the other sort of fusion is what we call inertial confinement, where there is no real active confinement. You're just squishing the hell out of a little pellet of the deuterium and tritium with maybe 200 of the world's most powerful lasers, squish it to very, very high density, um, until it self ignites, so kind of like a diesel engine in a way, and then just do that over and over again. Uh, needless to say, I'm a laser girl. I like to do uh, inertial confinement fusion. However, I have no preference over what way wins. I just want fusion to work, all right? So as you can see, these two methods kind of map onto the, you know, magnetic confinement fusion is kind of low density of particles for a long period of time. And then inertial confinement fusion, where the is basically confined by its own inertia, essentially, um, is a high density of particles for a short period of time, but then you do it over and over again. So supposing we get a uh, fusion to work, how would a fusion power plant work? So this is based on a, a tokamak design, but it could be a laser uh, driven design as well. So we have our plasma in the middle doing its thing, producing uh, the, the energetic neutrons, okay? Those neutrons fly out and they interact with the lithium that we need to produce the tritium. So that's its primary function. Uh, well, it's not just the primary function, actually. Uh, the other primary function of this blanket is that it gets hot. Uh, so it basically heats water to make steam to drive turbines. So it's a kind of depressingly Victorian back end to what is a very space age front end. But nonetheless, it's a good analog for the kind of power stations that we have now. So uh, essentially that's how we get, that's how we will get the energy out. If we manage to get what we call a neutronic fusion to work as in fusion without neutrons, because they do cause problems in terms of making material radioactive, we would have to think of better ways of, of, of doing this, right? So, uh, but for the time being, we're just gonna go with our uh, conventional uh, neutron producing fusion, uh, which, is, uh, which is what we're trying for now. So um, we've got many challenges ahead, all right? There are, there are facilities in existence that will help us understand how we can get to net energy, so how we can get more energy out than we're putting in. Um, the next step device called ITER is being built in the south of France at the moment. That's a big device. We are now having the advent of small private fusion um, and smaller devices that are publicly funded as well, but particularly in the UK with devices called STEP, for example. And we also have laser fusion as well. So actually the timescales are kind of all over the place. They could be more aggressive than we're actually uh, being set out by this big device called ETA, which is a global project. But the point is we're in a very transitional phase now. We're moving from you know, research that's done in universities and national labs into something that's going to be a very large scale and commercial venture where industry is already involved and already has a supply chain in, in the area of fusion. So we need you. We need you because we need people to make this work. We need the right scientists and engineers to have the, you know, to have the right skills to help us in this challenge, because it's not going to be me making this work. I'm already 43, right? <laughs> we need you to do this. So uh, on that note, this is a call to arms. We need you to come and, and work in Fusion. So on that note, thank you so much for listening. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kate. That was that was awesome. I love the call to arms. Um, so uh, why don't you? Yes, you stop sharing your screen. We've got time okay. for a couple of questions now. What we're going to do, Kate and, and everyone listening, um, is we'll have a couple of questions now and then I'll introduce our second speaker. And then at the end, after we've had a chance to uh, to ask uh, Ed, our second speaker, a couple of questions, but just purely for him, we'll bring Kate back again and we'll just keep throwing questions at the two of them until we run out of time or run out of questions, whichever comes first. So Kate, a um, couple of quick questions. Um, you mentioned about the, the nuclear waste from mm -hmm. fission. That's obviously an issue. Mm -hmm. You mentioned that fusion does have some nuclear waste, but 
it's not as bad. It doesn't last as long. And mm -hmm. someone in the question chat said, yeah, any amount of nuclear waste surely is an issue. So when you say it doesn't last very long, what do you mean by that? All oh, right. So, so we're sort of talking like a hundred years as opposed to, you know, so it's a lifetime rather than many lifetimes into the future. And also it's about quantity as well. But the point is you could reuse a vessel, for example, once it gets below a certain level. The thing is at the moment we are very, I mean, and Ed I'm sure will touch on this as well. This is a materials issue, right? Because not only do you need the materials to withstand, <laughs> this is kind of extreme conditions that we're creating, the most extreme conditions in the universe, right? You need a box around it. Turns out good old steel is a good thing, right? But you have to have specific sorts of steel because there are specific elements that really love to be activated and that they, they can cause particular problems in terms of the isotopes that are created. So a lot of work is going on at the moment as to understanding the sorts of steels that we can use that is gonna absolutely minimize that kind of issue, right? The point is this, right? It is gonna be a completely different scenario to fission, right? In terms of the kind of timescales over which this is gonna be a burden. Um, so it's, yeah, still, we, it's still a burden. You're, you're saying we're, we're still going to have waste materials. Yes, there's still going to be stuff we're going to have to do. The point but is, it's not no like a, we need to find somewhere to put drums of this stuff for yeah, yeah. literally forever, as yeah, opposed yeah. to yeah. We need, well, this is a yeah. hundred, hundred year time scale. So, so it's a different so engineering problem. For all of it. Yeah. There's strategies yeah. for all of it in terms of actual uh, waste storage and disposal, like deep underground, things like that. Um, there's a lot of active research going on in that area. But the, the point is this. There is no such thing as a free lunch, yeah. right? If you want energy, at some point you're going to make a compromise, right? And uh, fusion, all things being equal, is a pretty attractive option in terms of what it offers us. But unfortunately, there will be there if you open the atom up, <laughs> there's going to be some kind of radioactive. That's, stuff's going to happen. Stuff's okay. going to happen. Yeah. So, but the point is this. So this is why I'm frank because when people say it's clean, right? It is. Except there is, you know, there is, you can't say there's no waste because there will be, but it's not, but in no way is it the same scale of burden. And so you have to weigh up all these options. Sure. Any energy generation source, there's always compromise. There's always, you know, uh, upsides and downsides, right, in terms of um, environmental impact. Sure. Speaking of scale, you mentioned scale there. One of the questions that's come through is, can you just like you put up some pictures of some pretty impressive machines, but I mean, they could have been this size. Yeah. They could be the size of an entire yeah. city. What is the scale yeah. uh, okay. of the machines? So the, so the National Ignition Facility, which is the laser one I showed you, that's a real, uh, well, it's not a reactor at all. It's just a big vacuum chamber. That vacuum chamber is 10 meters in diameter. It's pretty sizable. So it's just a big empty space that the lasers get fired into. The pellet you're firing into is about a millimeter, right? So it's this tiny little ball bearing size pellet. Um, tokamaks, for example, can be anything from two, three, four meters up to about 10 meters uh, in, in, in sort of diameter. Um, and the size is largely determined by the approach you take. So the donut ones that I was showing you tend to be a lot bigger because um, uh, there's a different approach there. Whereas if you, um, so you kind of have to, the, the plasmas are unstable. So you either have to go bigger to overcome the sort of energy losses or you up the magnetic field. And if you do that, the devices can be like smaller cord apples, but they're still, you know, on the scale of some meters across. So bigger than people. Yes. <laughs> But don't take up an entire planet, right? So ta tangible scale, really. Yeah, and I've seen I've seen um, pictures and video of the of the ITER project that you mentioned, the one down yeah. in the south of France, which is the that's sort of the next prototype. Can that's we right. do this? Yeah. Um, and it's huge, like just just the most enormous scale of this thing. So if you're watching this and you haven't gone and checked that out, just go onto YouTube and and put in the search box ITER fusion and just go to town. It's it's quite the most amazing thing to have a look at. If you like pictures as well of fusion devices, look up Wendelstein 7X or W7X. It's, it's <laughs> W7X is probably easier there. Yeah. It's a variant on the theme. It's called Accelerator. And that is, and it's an exquisite engineering 
problem beautiful. oh is that is that the one where it twists the as it goes yeah oh, and it's yes. just delightful if you like Fantastic. pictures of good engineering yeah which i do not to not to mention the whole laser inertion inertial um confinement fusions which is that's a whole other thing all of these amazingly powerful lasers just mm. focusing down on a point we could keep doing this for hours kate we won't for now because we have another speaker <laughs> waiting in the wings so don't go away we'll come back to you in a little bit to ask you some more questions but in the meantime i'd like to introduce our second speaker um ed pickering ed is a, a senior lecturer in material science at the university of manchester and when kate said a minute ago that Look, this isn't easy, right? We need the right kind of materials in order to somehow keep these extraordinarily high temperature, just high physics environments contained. She wasn't mucking around. And so Ed is here to tell us a little bit more about what kind of materials do we need? Ed, welcome. I'll hand over to you and you can tell us a little bit about your research. Thank you very much, uh, Chris. So I'm just going to share my screen. Here we go. So uh, yeah, I'm, I'm uh, as Chris says, I'm going to talk to you about materials for, for nuclear fusion uh, applications and in particular the challenges that, and the, the ch challenges are really immense that we need to uh, that we we face uh, when designing and constructing uh, nuclear uh, nuclear fusion power uh, power plants to actually deliver electricity to the grid. And um, there are two names on here. One of the names is my name, and the other name is Anika Khan, Dr. Anika Khan. She's one of my colleagues here. There's a photo of her. Um, she would usually be given this alongside me, or uh, perhaps instead of me. And this is just to acknowledge that we usually give um, we've put together these slides together. Okay, so let's 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 start off. I'll start off really where Kate left off uh, by just acknowledging that there are two types, uh, primary primary types of, um, of fusion sort of confinement, the way in which we do fusion that, that are out there. One of them is this inertial confinement that uh, Kate is very much an, an expert in, where we can use lasers and, and, and some other fancy uh, mechanisms to, to confine our, our, our deuterium and, and uh, tritium and the plasma. Um, and the other one is magnetic confinement. And really, I'm going to talk a little uh, quite in detail about um, the challenges associated with tokamaks, which are um, associated, which uh, essentially are needed for magnetic confinement um, and the materials challenges associated with those. But actually, a lot of the materials challenges are similar in both inertial confinement and magnetic confinement. So this is what a, a tokamak uh, uh, looked like, and um, Kate uh, alluded to this. So this is actually the ETA tokamak, and I'll come on to, back on to talk about this uh, a bit later, um, with a scale bar as well to tell you about the scale of this. But just to let you know that actually uh, ETA is just one of many tokamaks that are either uh, that either already exist or are under construction around the world. Um, and yeah, so this is um, uh, the a, a map of the, the various tokamaks that, um, that currently exist around the world, and many more are being um, uh, constructed or at least designed uh, at the moment. Um, so most of these, well, all these are research reactors. We haven't built one that's connected the power grid yet, but that hopefully is, is not too far away. Um, and there are lots of uh, um, acronyms, abbreviations on here, so don't worry about that, but needs to say that actually there is sort of like a, a European tokamak development program that uh, and JET, that's the joint European Taurus, that's at, uh, at Oxford in the UK. Uh, JET was the first part of that really, and ETA is uh, the next stage that's being built in the south of France. Uh, and then DEMO is like this uh, demonstrator uh, fusion reactor, commercial fu uh, or a power producing fusion reactor that's coming, uh, that is planned for like 2040s onwards. Um, in the UK, though, we all, we we also have our own sort of um, uh, 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 reactor that we're looking to build, um, and that's called STEP. That's spherical tokamak for energy production. Uh, that's sort of um, happening at the same time as those European efforts. And then also, just to note, there are, there's a, there's been billions of pounds uh, uh, recently poured into um, uh, uh, into um, fusion uh, com uh, commercial fusion companies, startup companies, um, from public and, and private uh, and mixed public and private um, uh, investments. And, and as, as Chris alluded to and, uh, and um, uh, Kate mentioned as well, so this is ETA and it is actually being built in the south of France and there were some great videos on YouTube as, uh, uh, as, uh, as was mentioned. Uh, and yeah, you can actually see that bits of the tokamak starting to come together, which is a really amazing thing. And this is uh, the, the tokamak then. And 
it's about this sort of 30 meters by 30 meters. Um, that's the main sort of um, uh, heart of the of the fusion reactor. As, Ken, as Kate mentioned, there's actually a load of stuff outside of this associated with fuel, associated with, with processing the tritium and the, and the deuterium. There's a load of stuff associated that most power plants have associated with um, like generating electricity um, and you know properly extracting and converting that, uh, that power into electricity. Um, so it, this, this, this part is just um, a small part of, of a much bigger um, uh, uh, you know, set of buildings and and uh, ancillary equipment that you need um, for uh, to actually do a do commercial fusion. Okay, so let's let's go back. Uh, let, let's now to, to talk about the materials challenges more specifically. And all of, all of the material, well, almost all of the materials challenges, ultimately um, uh, are tr can we can trace back to the fusion reaction itself. Okay, so. Um, as, uh, as uh, Kate mentioned, we fuse together tritium and deuterium here, and we and given off by that reaction are helium um, uh, uh, helium nuclei and a neutron as well. And this, uh, you don't need to worry about the units here, but this is essentially the amount of um, kinetic energy that these are given off with. Um, so this is 14 uh, MeV, mega electron volts, and this is 3.5 MeV. And essentially it's this kinetic energy that if we extract that from the neutrons, we can then, and we let's say, run that through, um, through extract that to using water, for instance, use that to heat water. We can then use that water to drive steam turbines and create electricity. So it's ultimately this. This is the way in which we're we're extracting a lot. Uh, a lot of the power is is by capturing um, uh, these these particles. Okay. So um, we'll go on to talk about lots of different things. But as as, as Kate mentioned. The temperature inside the reactor is extremely hot, so 150 million degrees C. Um, that's, that's very hot indeed. Fortunately, so there's no material that could possibly withstand that temperature and retain and remain solid. Everything would turn into a plasma. But um, uh, fortunately, the the temperatures um, just next to that plasma are not quite so hot. So they might be um, thousands of degrees C, so uh, a thousand degrees C or a couple of thousand degrees C. So it's more a little bit more manageable, and that's a good thing. Um, uh, the fast particles um, that are given off by the plasma um, collide with the materials and they cause a, a lot of damage. Um, and so both the, the these temperatures, even if they're um, a thousand or a couple thousand degrees C, are uh, quite damaging. And so are these fast particles. And there are many more issues for um, uh, associated with this reaction and the way in which we do this reaction that are um, uh, challenges for uh, materials. And I'll just talk about them in a bit more detail in the next slide. So if we have a look at all the uh, materials issues for fusion reactors, here is a list and we'll go into each of these in a bit more detail. So we've got high heat loads, in other words, high temperatures, in particular, when we when our plasma doesn't behave in the right way, we can have very high heat loads in particular areas. We've got these really fast neutrons coming off and they're destroying our materials slowly but surely. Uh, and, and that's a key challenge. We want, as, and Kate, as Kate mentioned before, our materials to remain low activation. So we want the elements that we use inside of our steels, for instance, to be reduced activation. We'll talk about that. Um, helium is a big problem. We get helium um, because it's given is given off as a byproduct of, of the uh, of the reaction, but also because it's generated by transmutation by essentially radioactive decay inside of our materials. Um, we have the plasma. This could actually physically erode our materials, and we'll come on to talk about that. And then finally, uh, uh, last but not least, really, uh, high magnetic fields. So we need very high magnetic fields, and these can uh, damage our materials. So you can see there are an immense, uh, uh, there are an immense array of sort of materials challenges here that we need to overcome in order to build a fully functioning and commercially viable fusion reactor. Okay. And I'll talk about each of these in, in a bit more detail. So firstly, if we look at the, the fast neutrons, if we imagine a neutron coming in uh, to our material here, and um, you may be, uh, hopefully be aware that in a solid, mo uh, lots of solid materials, and most metals included, have a nice ordered arrangement of atoms. Uh, so they are crystalline materials. And when we bombard that, those, uh, um, uh, uh, those such materials with a fast neutron, we can start to cause damage into the structure. So we can remove atoms from their original positions and they are repositioned elsewhere. Now, actually, this is a bit more, uh, this happens in a bit more of an extreme way. So if our neutron comes in, it collides with lots of different particles and they will collide with other different particles. And as we have this massive cascade of damage that happens, 
and each of the um, green particles here are essentially uh, um, uh, each of these green atoms are atoms that are displaced and not where they should be in the uh, in the um, uh, in the material. And each each atom in the material can be displaced or may well this is looks like what would be the uh, least designed for may be displaced tens of times during a, a reactor year. So uh, so in in terms of a, a year of operation of the reactor, individual atoms inside some components will be displaced tens of times by continuous bombardment with these neutrons. It's a huge issue. This introduces lots of um, uh, defects inside the materials where the lattice doesn't line up anymore. It makes things harder. It makes things more brittle. I won't go into the details of that now, but needs to say it's a huge problem. And that's uh, irradiation damage, we call that. And that's uh, uh, caused by these fast neutrons. So that's fast neutrons. High heat loads is another one that I mentioned uh, at the start. So um, the uh, uh, um, the sort of heat loads that we're going to expect here are some of the highest heat loads in uh, in off normal events in in uh, so outside normal operation um, uh, the uh, inside the tokamak that we experience pretty much anywhere. So if we look at um, uh, the sort of um, heat loads that we uh, see in lots of different um, uh, everyday, so to speak, uh, scenarios. Um, inside a jet engine um, and the re-entry vehicle, uh, re-entry of a vehicle from space, both of these actually see less heat load than we expected uh, in, this, in some parts of ITER when it's operating at steady state. This is normal operating conditions. And then when things go wrong, you start to get huge um, power loads, so huge um, a huge amount of energy dumped in a short period of time uh, per meter squared, and uh, yeah, this can be exceptionally damaging to materials and is way uh, way above where a lot of materials melt or would melt, for instance. So we've got to be very careful when when it comes to this sort of stuff. So that's high E loads, another challenge. Um, as as uh, we've already talked about, reduced activation is a key thing. So this is a really interesting periodic table. This is a periodic table that is uh, essentially based on calculations where um, we've calculated how long it takes if an element exists within a fusion reactor and, and spends actually um, uh, 14 years inside of a fusion reactor. That This might be a typical lifetime, maybe a little bit longer than, than would be expected, but this sort of uh, lifetime inside the material, inside the, re the reactor, sorry. How long does it take to decay to UK low level waste? So that's low level radioactive waste. So if you look um, at, at this, at the scale at the top uh, at the side here, um, 100 years is sort of where we want where we want to be aiming for maximum, okay, for this. So that's 100 years until we can essentially uh, bury it as, uh, as low level waste. And it's pretty, in the, you know, it's, it's not particularly hazardous at all. And you can see that many of the elements that we might usually use to make our materials, um, so things like we, uh, like copper and nickel, are um, we can't use, okay? Or we've got to really be careful about how much of it we use because they can uh, essentially um, yeah, be, become radioactive. In, so they're bombarded by neutrons, they become radioactive, they activate, so to speak, and they, uh, we, they exist um, for many thousands of years if we're not careful. So, for instance, nickel here, this says 46,000 years until that, that eventually decays um, to, to low level waste. So we we'll to be really careful about the elements we, we choose, and it really does limit the materials we've got to choose from, too. Another challenge that I mentioned before, um, helium. Helium exposure, depending on the temperature here, we can get things like nano bubbles forming, you can get uh, bubbles of, of helium uh, forming at the surface of the material when the, the, the helium uh, is implanted into it um, from the plasma. We get strange fuzzies, uh, fuzzy uh, type uh, formations forming on the surface of the materials that can really degrade the properties. And we can even get large voids forming as well uh, at particularly high temperatures. So all these things uh, damage the thermal uh, properties, damage the mechanical properties. And also um, these voids are great places for where tritium, if it happens to leak anywhere or, or go anywhere, can be retained in the material. Tritium is radioactive and then so it makes the material radioactive. And also it's very precious. We don't want to, we want tritium in the plasma we don't want it stored in our materials so huge problems associated with helium exposure 
The plasma is another um, key thing. So the plasma can erode our material, like physically erode our material. That could, we can erode and uh, my material redeposit it in elsewhere in uh, places of the reactor that can cause dust as well. Um, the plasma can uh, implant tritium um, into uh, our materials, which is a problem. Um, and ultimately, this sort of uh, continuous erosion by the plasmas, uh, plasma can cause, just like with the, the helium we saw, we saw bubbles, blisters to form in the surface of the materials and ultimately to the embrittlement, um, so the, the loss of the mechanical integrity of the materials. So, yeah, that's another challenge. And there's more. Which is the final one, though? Um, this is uh, mag so magnetic fields. So um, we actually require superconducting magnets to generate the strong enough magnetic field to contain um, the uh, to to confine the plasma and uh, and uh, and, uh, and do uh, you know keep that in the, in in the right shape and, and, and performing in the right way. And the uh, magnetic fields that um, uh, we will be experienced inside ETA are probably going to be maximum about 13 to 14 Tesla, which is huge. Um, just to give you an idea, um, a typical MRI scanner is only about one and a half Tesla. Um, and yeah, that's quite a lot. And it actually contains some superconducting materials operating about liquid helium temperatures here. Um, and the question, there's a question mark about whether we also need to worry about the impact of the magnetic fields and changing magnetic fields on the materials involved. Um, and there are also uh, challenges associated with superconducting materials that we use inside those magnets. So yeah. Um, so needs to say that we've got some challenges ahead of us, okay? So if we look at ETA, um, uh, you might think, well, what are, we, what, are the, um, uh, what are the candidate materials at the moment? And none of these might be perfect, but we're gonna try them in any case. Well, I'll just list, list some here. So the, the cryostat and the vacuum vessel, so sort of the, the outer bit of this, uh, outer components of this, were probably made from stainless steel. So a very straightforward material, uh, in theory at least, that we can readily make and join. Um, the, uh, um, uh, uh, yeah, so both the cryostat, so that's the uh, bit that's containing the super superconducting magnets at, at low temperatures, and the vacuum vessel, both are made of stainless steel. There's a bit of the um, uh, tokamak here where essentially the plasma sort of is exhausted, we call it, into. So it's sort of directed in, in, uh, into that region. And a lot of energy is, is deposited in that region with very high heat loads. And uh, we're actually, and this is called the diverter, and we're going to make that out of tungsten. And we're making that out of tungsten essentially because tungsten melts at a very high temperature, so about 3000 degrees C. And um, yeah, so we need a high to melting point uh, material there. For the inside of the um, uh, uh, reactor, so the sort of the walls of, uh, of, of Tokamak, would use some people have talked about using tungsten, some people about using other materials. Beryllium um, looks like it's going to be a, a, a material of choice there. Maybe not for all, all reactors. Don't think the UK step reactor will use beryllium, for instance, but that's an option. And later in the, 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 the blanket, we actually use different steel components um, that are further back uh, away from the plasma. And then um, niobium tin or niobium titanium uh, will be used for the superconducting materials uh, inside the magnets. So that sort of give you gives you an overview of the sort of materials that we use, but there'll be many other and many others beside the these and very complicated components. Okay. Right. So that's all I really want to say on uh, materials challenges for fusion. What I would also just like to say in the in my final slide is that. Um, if you're interested in physics and you're interested in, in applications of physics and also a bit of chemistry, maybe engineering as well, you might want to consider material science and engineering as a, as a degree choice or as a topic for of study. Um, certainly for our fusion reactors, we need, as well as lots of physicists, uh, lots more physicists, we need lots more material science and engineers. Um, and uh, yeah, basically this is a call, uh, a call uh, to, to arms to say, you know, can you help us solve our materials challenges? Um, and if you're interested in finding out about um, more about material science, you can Google Discover Materials or just Google Material Science and Engineering. Uh, you can look at things like the UCAS website and, uh, and, uh, and other bits and pieces. And you can study at lots of uh, really great universities. Um, so, yeah, it's certainly worth, some, uh, worth considering. OK, and I think that's me done. So um, hopefully I didn't go too far over time. But, yeah, I'd be very happy to answer any questions that, uh, that everybody's got. So thank you.
Thank you so much, Ed. That's that's fantastic. Stick around because we've got a whole bunch of questions. Uh, questions still coming through, and then we'll get Kate back in a second to um, to answer a few more the, of the general ones that have come through. Um, First of all, the question which, which came up, which I think is actually a really good one. You were talking about extraordinarily high temperatures. You mentioned that a couple of times. Temperatures which are just, if not literally off the scale, at least off the experience scale. We're dealing with stuff that we haven't had to deal with before. Why doesn't everything just melt? I think that's a really good question. You know, yeah, if we're talking very, huge temperatures. Why doesn't all the steel just melt? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's a very good question. So it's because it's, we're, and we're, we're fortunate in this, uh, in, in the, yeah, in that they don't melt, right? So, so basically, um, all of that energy, all of that temperature, is actually confined by the magnetic field inside the plasma. So, all that, so the temperatures, you know, we, we mentioned one hundred fifty million degrees C. This only happens at the very centre within the plasma, basically. So, because and because that's all contained within the kinetic energies of the charged particles, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, as long as those charged particles don't hit the wall we're actually okay, okay? We, we still will see very, very high uh, heat, those very, very high temperatures, particularly if the plasma accidentally touches the, you know, it can just, it can literally, you know, erode tungsten away and melt tungsten away very, very easily. Um, so you've got to be really, really careful. But um, we, yeah, essentially we're just trying, we're just confining all that energy, all of that temperature, if you like, um, with, uh, using the magnetic fields. Um, and that, that, that is okay. That's Hence the confinement challenges, because if you don't confine it, all that energy is, you yeah, know, yeah. you're and just going to lose it really, really quickly and destroy it. Yeah. As, as well, you can, if you lose control of that confinement, that all that energy can get dumped onto particular components and wipe them out, essentially. And that's presumably not a good thing. Um, you, you mentioned amongst all of your, your list of all of the engineering challenges, all of these different ways in which the materials can be damaged, messed up, you know, they, they, they affect the materials you choose. But surely whatever you choose, like this is a really high intensity, high energy, high, you know, highly charged environment. Does this mean that that like there would there need to be an enormous amount of maintenance, right? That that would you have to be going in and changing the materials constantly in the operation of this? Do you do you think that that's gonna get in the way of actually trying to make a workable fusion sure. power plant? Yeah, I mean, and this this is a concern, right? That it's not that you need to change the materials so often that it becomes commercially not viable. It's too expensive. You, you have to you have to shut the material the plant down too much, and then you know you, you spend so much money replacing components. It's a concern. It certainly is a concern. Um, and we're just and we're just having to work out and see, do lots of research as to whether that will or be the case for lots of different materials, lots of different components. Uh, there are some amazing robotics that are used um, uh, in fusion reactors in to current tokamaks um, to help that the, the are being designed so that we can replace co damaged components uh, without uh, a human going in there very quickly um, and maybe even do things like repair welding and repair joining and that sort of stuff. Um, uh, so, so it it might be the case what would be ideal is that our materials don't grade too degrade too much and when we they do degrade we can replace them with robotics in an automated way that doesn't doesn't take a lot of time so you'd be um, able to perhaps you know design it in such a way that you don't have to completely take the thing apart to the point where a human being could crawl in there and fix it up exactly. that it might be a, a, a bit more of an automated process and it exactly. wouldn't involve too much shutting down yeah and that we we yeah. have sections of the reactor it's like a, it, it, everything is, is is in like little bits that essentially we can take those bits off and then put, put another bit back on yeah. yeah okay look at this point kate why don't you throw your camera and microphone back on come back and join us um there's a, there's a question that i wanted to throw to you at at this point you've both talked about um, the main fusion reaction or reactions that we're looking at here on earth but it's come up a couple of times in the question why just that one? Like, surely there are loads of different fusion reactions possible. So why can't we try a whole bunch of them and see which one's best? Well, I mean, you can, but the, but the bottom line is, if you look at bang for buck, and what do I mean by that? Number of reactions, reactivity, right? Versus temperature. Um, it's the one that gets going quickest, soonest, and, um, and increases rapidly. There are other reactions where at higher temperatures you get a higher reactivity, but 
it's harder to get them going. You need more energy in the startup costs, let's say, for example, um, deuterium, deuterium, for example, or um, uh, boron, deuterium, right? Boron, deuterium, is that the Maybe. other one? But Let's say for way, the sake of an argument, yeah. Yeah, that ideally, the ones that are harder to start but give you more energy and don't produce neutrons, because you can see that the neutrons are an issue, they're good in that they're, they allow us to, in a Victorian way, capture the energy and heat water. But on the other hand, if we could do it without neutrons, uh, yeah, there's a bigger startup cost, but the, the benefit is then you don't have the some of the materials issues that you would have with high energy neutrons. The point is that what we've picked now, we've backed the horse that we know is probably going to get over the line with the least amount of kind of adjustment to what we know already uh, in terms of, it, in some senses, it's a good analogue to what we know. If we are heating water to make steam to drive turbines, that already slots into kind of the systems that we know anyway, yeah. right? So don't change too much at once. That's always the rule of science, isn't it? When you change. <laughs> It seems it seems like it's hard enough as it is. Let's just yeah. choose the one that we've got the most confidence yeah. in. That that seems perfectly reasonable. Yeah. Hey, listen, speaking of such things, um, one of the questions that came up, and I had to go and do a quick Google because uh, I'd, I'd missed this particular headline. Um, I think, Ed, you put up a slide that said, look, we've got jet at the moment and eaters being, being made right now. Um, and so first question that came up was, We've left the EU. Are we still involved with ITER? So just, just pin that one for a second. Um, but then the next question was, Jacob Rees-Mogg has come out and said, we're going to have our first prototype power plant being built somewhere near Nottingham in 2040. So I guess the question to you both really is, and Ed, why didn't you start on this one? Is that going to happen? Like that suddenly seems really soon. That's not far away at all. Yeah. Uh, is Rees-Mogg right? Uh, I'd like to hope he's right. Um, uh, and, uh, but, um, yes, so that, that's, that's certainly the, so that's the step reactor he's talking, he's, he's referring to there. And this has been in the pipe work for a few years now. Um, and the idea is that actually by the end of 2024, they have a, 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 a preliminary sort of design for this and a more firmed up design by about 2028, I think it is. And then it goes into, um, full um, uh, construction uh, in the 2030s. Um, I think I think it's perfectly possible that they actually that they construct a reactor and that they get something working. Now uh, uh, that, that they get something that that uh, starts to work, and I think it's really important actually that we do do this. Um, because we can spend a, a lot of time fiddling around, um, trying to do some calculations and small scale experiments and, and, you know, trying to predict what happens. But ultimately, to, um, and this is quite unfortunate, but to, in order to um, test materials inside a fusion reactor, you first need to build a fusion reactor. Uh, and um, so it's going to be really, really important for us to, um, and, and also this, this goes for the, for the plasma physics and lots of different things. It's really important for us to actually build that reactor, even if we don't get it right. And we'll learn a huge amount uh, um, uh, about it by building it. Yeah. So I don't think the time scales are ridiculous by any means. Yeah. Um, and I think that with the right amount of funding and the right amount of money, we can we can we can uh, we can construct step by twenty forty. Yeah. Kate, I mean, would you agree with that? Yeah. So so first of all, Reesmog wouldn't know about this. The point is, he's been briefed. <laughs> he's been briefed by people who know what they're talking about, i.e., UKAA, pr presumably, right? Um, and it's based on credible, credible science, right? Um, and the reason why it can go faster is because it's this thing that I was talking about. It's a, a sort of tight aspect ratio called Apple approach. It's a small one with a high magnetic field. It's only in the last decade that we've been. This is the step reactor. You're yeah, talking exactly. About. Yeah. Only in the last decade we've been we've had the magnet systems that we could do this. That's why ITER exists because that had to happen. But I mean, let's just. Right, so ITER involves the globe, right? There are many partners. It's a global project. It's kind of been divided up like a Terry's chocolate orange, right, to, to do this project. It's taken a long time. The bit of paper that said we're going to do something like ITER was signed in 80, I think six or seven by Reagan and Gorbachev, right? So, wow. and yeah. it's taken, and I mean, when I started my PhD, which is 100 years ago, no, uh, 2001, they were arguing about where it was going to be, right? Because obviously it's a collaboration. Now, 
yeah, that means it takes a long time, but also it means that everyone has a slice of the IP pie and fusion must be equitable right from the outset, right? It is for everyone. And so everyone needs to have ownership over it and the IP that is generated. So in that sense, it's a good approach uh, uh, in that sense. So, you know, you, you can take a long time over it or you can have these short, quite aggressive timescale projects. Either way, it's got to happen regardless. Yeah, so. yeah. Listen, we do have to call it uh, to an end there. We've, uh, we've used up our hour. So could I have a huge thank you to Kate and to Ed? You can use the reaction button down the bottom of the Zoom window if you want. Just let all your hand claps and your love hearts and your thumbs up just fly up the screen. Um, we are going to have to call it to an end. Listen, if your question wasn't asked and you're a participant in the masterclass, get on the website and go to the question forum and throw it in there because we have literal fusion experts waiting for your call, waiting for your question to get on there and answer it. Um, the, event, the recording has, sorry, the event has been recorded. We've recorded this whole thing. So that's going to be thrown up onto the, uh, onto the Masterclass website as well. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I hope we'll get all of you back again next week when we're going to have a look at nuclear physics and medical physics. That's going to be a really good one. One last huge thank you, Kate and Ed. Thanks for joining us. Thank you all for coming along tonight. Have a good evening. We'll see you next week.